Okay, so uh, let's carry on. Um, I, I think I'll skip the overeating. Or should I do it? Let's do it. Okay. Behavior. Obese people ov often overeat, okay? Uh, rule, eat when you're hungry. Eat tasty food, okay? That's the rule, okay? Uh, the analysis. Though we need food for energy, growth, and various vital bodily functions, that's not what makes us eat, okay? We eat because we're hungry. <laughs> and or enjoy food. Hunger and food uh, enjoyment are mechanisms uh, that evolved in order to motivate us to eat. Like the feelings of wounded pride, insult, desire for revenge, and honor that makes us reject lopsided offers in the ultimatum game. Uh, this overeating is an instance of biological evolution, okay, which has not yet had time to take account of the sedentary nature of much of modern life. Okay, just like I think also the wounded pride, insult, desire for revenge and honor, that's also, that's probably also biological. I'm not sure, but I, I conjecture. <coughs> On the time scale of biological evolution, obesity is highly uncommon, okay? So the rule is rational, uh, okay? In spite of its irrational consequences for the obese. Okay, question, yeah? I, for many people, it doesn't work so well. That's right. I think in this case, yeah, it's sort of a counterexample to my thesis. That's right. Uh, that's why I, I was tempted to skip it. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but for the sake of honesty, yes, uh, I said, what the hell, let's, uh, let's do it. Okay? I, I think this is... Uh, this is an instance of evolution, and, and obese people indeed behave irrationally, and, uh, and it's not contrived, okay? Uh, but it's uncommon on the evolutionary scale. So I think, I think in a sense, it, it does go along with our thesis, that uncommon things yeah, are, not, uh, are not covered by the rule, okay? In, in uncommon scenarios, in uncommon scenarios, the behavioral rule, the, the heuristic or the bias of behavioral economics uh, will uh, not necessarily work, okay? Now, in, in, in the instances that I've given uh, up to now, and I think uh, for the rest of this talk, uh, the uh, uh, the uncommon was so uncommon that it was indeed contrived. Okay, it was totally unnatural. Here, obesity is natural. Okay, but on the on the uh, on the evolutionary time scale, it's uh, it's um, uncommon. Okay, so you could look at it as a as a counterexample to my thesis, or you could look at it as uh, an explanation of, or a, 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 an ex example of my thesis, <coughs> whichever you prefer, <laughs> okay? Okay, let's go to the next one. Discounts, okay. Uh, again, a quote from Taylor. The behavior is, Linnea, Linnea is chopping for a clock radio. Uh, He's very, uh, he's very uh, original in his choice of names. Yes. Uh, we, yesterday we had Tom and Jerry. <laughs> okay. Uh, Linnea, Linnea is shopping for a clock radio. 
She finds a model she likes at what her research suggests is a good price, $45. As she's about to buy it, the clerk at the store mentions that the same radio is on sale for $35 at a new branch of the store, 10 minutes away, that is holding a grand opening sale. Does she drive to the other store to make the purchase? On another shopping trip, Linnea is shopping for a television set and finds one at the good price of $495. The clerk mentions that the same model is on sale at another store 10 minutes away for $485. Same question, does she drive to the other store to make this the purchase? But likely different answer, okay? If, t if Linnea spends 10 minutes to save $10 on a small purchase, but not a large one, she is not valuing time consistently. Okay. <coughs> That's uh, Taylor. Rule. Evaluate discounts relative to the base price. For example, as a percentage. Okay. That's how you should look at a discount. Okay. Why not in absolutes? Okay, yeah, here, yeah I'm, I'm going to do the analysis okay. now, okay? <laughs> now I'm going to do the analysis. So this uh, always uh, more or less the same, uh, um, uh, the same setup. We have behavior, scenario, behavior, rule, analysis, okay? But sometimes there are variations. Okay. Analysis, as a rough rule, the more money is spent on a purchase, the more time is spent deciding on it, rationally. Okay. When considering a cheaper alternative, one should take account of the time needed to evaluate it. Okay. A bigger purchase is... Uh, it's a bigger investment in thought, okay? Thinking of discounts as a percentage reflects this rationale. The Linnaeus story is perhaps different, and that's why it's red and not blue, okay? Uh, as the same model is offered, okay? But this is highly unusual. One might even say contrived. After spending time selling the set, the television set, why would the clerk send Linnea elsewhere? Okay? This is a red case where the heuristic is rational, but the scenario is contrived. By the way, uh, I forgot to say that I was going to start this morning's uh, talk uh, with this remark. Going back to uh, beer on the beach, okay? Uh, and I uh, uh, internalized the uh, discussion of that yesterday, and I, I really think uh, there, there is something to the, to the criticism. But I, I'd like to point out that uh, these, he did not ask people who were lying on the beach and dying of, or, or, and really wanting a beer. He didn't ask those people. He asked other people, what would you do, okay, if you were lying on a beach and uh, somebody had to go to the supermarket, okay? What would you do? In other words, this guy is not, he has to imagine being very thirsty, yeah? Uh, and, uh, and, and I think in this case, the, 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 uh, the clue you get the, from, from the question, supermarket, you immediately go, the, the person who is asked the question, the, the, the respondent, is, is immediately goes to how, how much does beer cost in a supermarket? And I'll say a little more. And okay, so, so I think if you would really ask people lying on the beach, surveying them, you might get a different answer. But 
those, what would you do? Uh, a lot of uh, BE, behavioral economics, is based on what would you do, okay? What would you do? Oh, we'll get to the framing also, yes? Uh, that's another what would you do. Uh, what do you do is more important. Some of behavioral economics is what do you do, okay? We'll get to some, uh, but this is what would you do, okay? And, and uh, not so much this as, as, the, uh, as the beer on the beach. Okay, let's go on. Any questions? Questions? Uh, at the end of each uh, example, uh, you're welcome to raise your hands and uh, we'll discuss the example. And yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Budget premium gas is a good one. Um, background. Many households, especially those on tight budgets, use explicit budgeting rules. So and so much for food, so and so much for utilities, so and so much for gasoline, and so on. These budgets exist for sensible, understandable reasons. Yeah, I'm quoting Taylor, okay? This, that's his language, okay? <coughs> While it's doubtful that any car really requires premium gas, for some models, premium is recommended. And some people buy premium because they think wrongly that it's better for the engine. Behavior. When the price of gas fell in 2008 by roughly 50%, the sales of premium gas shot up. Rather than using the extra money in the gas budget for other things they wanted, such as a <laughs> ball game or a steak, many people shifted from regular to premium gas, okay? Because they had more money in the uh, in the uh, gas budget, okay? They had money left over in the gas budget. They didn't know what to do with the money. It had to be spent on gas, all right? So they bought premium instead of buying regular. Okay. Uh, this uh, Hastings and Shapiro on the QJE, and Taylor quotes it. The rule? Stick to the budget, okay? Uh, and analysis. Setting up non-fungible budgets is not entirely silly. A household that makes a serious effort to create a financial plan 
will have an easier time living within its means. Uh, okay? Sometimes those budgets can lead to bad decision making. And that's also the analysis here is also a quote from Taylor. In other words, uh, Taylor is, uh, uh, or Thaler is uh, um, agreeing with us over here. In other words, uh, uh, sticking to the budget is important. Once you go away from the budget, uh, you will be tempted, or you may be tempted, to um, to, uh, uh, to to go away from it entirely. Yes, I I I, I know the uh, uh, this this is involved with avoiding temptation, which we discussed yesterday, uh, and I know this for myself. Uh, I, uh, in order to keep my weight down, okay, I. Uh, I eat only salads on Sundays, right after Shabbat. Uh, I eat only salads. I, d I don't eat any uh, carbohydrates, no, no pasta, no potatoes, no cake, no, no carbohydrates at all. Only salads, yes, and drink coffee. Uh, and that's what I do the whole Sunday. And sometimes I'm tempted to eat one cookie, okay? <laughs> and I say, no, I'm not going to eat that cookie because if I eat that one cookie, then the whole, the whole uh, plan for that Sunday is spoiled, okay? <laughs> so the same thing with the budgets, uh, okay? I, uh, thank God I, I, I'm not, I don't live on budgets, but, but I understand that some people have to, yes? Some people do live on budgets. And the idea is not to violate the budget. Okay. Probability matching. Uh, a subject is seated in front of a device that emits once in 10 seconds either a red or a green light at random. The probability of red is one quarter, and that of green, three quarters. Each time, the subject must predict the color of the light. Success is rewarded, okay? Each time you predict the color of the light correctly, <coughs> you get a dollar or 50 cents or something. This is 1959, so it may be 10 cents here. And we were talking about something like that. We're talking about $1951 the other day here in the, in the uh, was, was it in yeah. your, it was in your talk, right? So in, in, the, in the 50s, uh, it may have been uh, rewarded by 10 cents or something like that. I don't know. Uh, Is the subject told what probabilities are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, OK. I don't think Let's say, yeah, OK, let's say he's told what the probabilities are. Overwhelmingly. Subjects predict red one quarter of the time and green three quarters of the time. And that's not optimal, as the probability of success is then only five eighths, okay? Uh, okay, it's three quarters times three quarters, okay? Um, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, Plus one times one What's that? Yeah, okay, plus one quarter. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay, I'm not too good at math. Uh, yeah, as it is then only five eighths. Whereas always predicting green has a success probability of three quarters. Rule Social desirability. Do what's expected of you, do what looks good, okay? Uh, and uh, there's a lot of evidence for that. Uh, uh, and and uh, actually, Maya Bahilel uh, told me about the social desirability bias, OK? You try to guess what the experimenter wants from you, OK? People are not used to sitting in front of devices that emit colored lights at random. They have not developed rules to deal with such situations, okay? So they use a social desirability rule. 
<coughs> which applies specifically to surveys. In our case, subjects want to show their skill at guessing right. Always predicting the same would make them look obtuse, dull, and obsessive. Incidentally, in real life, people do not probability match, okay? Most of us have a choice of routes in getting to work in the morning. Sometimes one route is faster, sometimes another. By the way, I, I specifically have a choice of routes, and, and one route is better at certain times, and another route is better at other times, okay? Uh, but it's probabilistic. You, know, you could have uh, traffic jams, or you could have what's even more uh, common in Jerusalem these days is construction. You know, the road is blocked because of some uh, uh, tractor or something like that, and, and you, you have to wait. But you don't know where it's going to be. Uh, people take the same route every day, which is precisely the optimal strategy, uh, assuming that they go to work at the same time every day. Okay, So they take the same route. Uh, questions? Right. Yeah. Point. So this experiment, like hyperbolic discounting, yes. is done on pigeons. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and pigeons probability match. Okay. <laughs> uh, pigeons also probability match. So social desirability doesn't, uh, doesn't apply to pigeons. Good question. Why, why do pigeons so the, probability the, the match? The explanation is that, uh, that this is an art, again, this is an artificial setup. And that in, in, uh, the pigeons are not used to it, but why do they probability match? Uh, because, because, I mean, the social desirability, no, maybe no, the no. social desirability <laughs> doesn't apply to them, I don't know. Uh, but but uh, on the face of it, social desirability does not apply to pigeons. Yeah. I, I agree with that. But the argument is that the situations that they face in reality uh, have changing <coughs> probabilities. Yeah. Uh, and so probability matching is a way to avoid getting stuck with one option which may in the long run not be successful. Okay, all right. Okay, yes sir, yes. Now we come to the bombing mission, <laughs> and this is this is a true story. Okay, at least uh, it was. To okay, I'll, I'll attribute it afterwards. During World War II, a squadron of American bombers based on the island of Saipan in the Pacific Ocean was assigned the mission of flying 25 bombing sorties to Tokyo, 2,000 miles away. Because of the great distance, most of the weight that the bombers could carry was needed for fuel. Very little could be used for the payoff for bombs. The mission was very dangerous. In similar previous missions, only a quarter of the airmen survived. As the mission was about to begin, an operations research officer arrived from Washington with a brilliant proposal. Half the airmen, to be chosen by lot, would fly just one sortie 
but it would be one way. Thus much more weight could be devoted to bombs and in that single one-way sortie as many bombs could be delivered as in 25 round-trip sorties. Okay? And each airman's survival probability would increase from a quarter to a half. Okay, that was the proposal. And if you think about it, it's, it's, a, it's a tragic situation, but you know, that's what war is about. Behavior. The airman unanimously refused the uh, kind offer. When individually asked why, each replied that he is a better pilot than average, okay? That he will not be shot down. Rule. In the Army, look ahead just one day, especially in wartime. Tomorrow will take care of itself, okay? Uh, and actually, it's not only in wartime. In the Army, <laughs> uh, I've experienced this myself. Uh, you, you, um, okay, you, the question is whether to go on, on leave the Shabbat before Passover or, uh, or, um, you, 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 <coughs> or to go on leave or to wait until Passover and then go on to, to trade with somebody. You have leave this Shabbat, okay? And another person comes to you and says, give me this Shabbat, I'd like this Shabbat. Another soldier comes to you, I'd like this Shabbat. You can have my turn, which is on Passover next week. I say, no, no. <laughs> Look ahead just one day, okay? I, if, if I'm supposed to, go, because next, next week, all the leaves could be uh, uh, canceled, or next week peace could break out, and and uh, uh, and uh, the 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 reason that you're in the reserves uh, could be uh, uh, canceled, and you know, all the reserves could be released. Either way, you can, you can't tell, okay? Uh, but that that's a trivial thing here in the army, it, it, you know, in wartime situation. Look ahead, just to survive one more day, okay? Survive one more day. That's the rule in the army. So, and, and, and they didn't, they didn't um, say this rule explicitly, okay? They weren't thinking of the rule explicitly, but implicitly, that's what they wanted. They, th they wanted just to stay alive another day, okay? And the, the operations research officer's proposal would not allow that. Analysis especially in a war. Changes are so rapid and unexpected that it makes no sense for soldiers to make long-term plans. The airmen were following this rule subconsciously. Irrelevant postscript. The story has a beautiful, surprising denouement. After three sorties, in, the, in this uh, new thing, the, the, this mission, the island of Iwo Jima, 600 miles from Tokyo, fell to the Americans. And the Sepan mission was canceled. So the airmen had been right. The unconsciously adopted rule worked. That, of course, does not change the irrationality of the decision since a priori, the cancellation was unlikely, okay? This was told, the story was, it, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a very moving story. It was uh, told to me by Kenneth Arrow, and he attributed the story to Mellow Flood. I don't think this was ever published, but I heard it from Arrow uh, in, in person. Bees, artificial flowers, and nectar. A 
Okay, here is a field of artificial flowers, and there's a bee flitting around. And what's the story? The setup is, <coughs> first, only the yellow flowers get nectar, okay? The experimenter has this field of artificial flowers. By the way, we have one right next to us, downstairs, right next to the, the Avi Schmieder is in charge of a field of artificial flowers like this, and they, well, he was, I don't know whether it still exists, but years ago it was there. And you could give nectar to some of the flowers or all of the flowers or none of the flowers, okay? Nectar is simply sugar water. Uh, so first, only the yellow flowers get nectar, and then only the blue flowers, okay? So, so for a, a period of time, uh, week or so, only the yellow flowers get the nectar and the blue flowers do not. And then you cut off the uh, nectar from the yellow flowers and you give it to, and you do give nectar to the blue flowers. The behavior. In the first period, the bees learn to visit only yellow flowers. In the second, they continue to visit only yellow flowers until they starve to death, okay? And this is, un this is work of Andreas Birch, a, a German uh, uh, ecologist who, uh, it's unpublished, it was reported to me by Avi Schmieder, who is our ecologist, okay? Uh, rule. The rule is go by experience. Okay. Um, analysis. If you were dying of thirst in the desert, would you try to extract water from a stone? To the bees, blue flowers are like stones. Okay, they have learned that they do not have nectar. There's no point in going to the blue flowers. This is a caricature of be uh, behavioral economics demonstrations of irrational behavior. It's utterly contrived, utterly unnatural. In nature, you don't have somebody controlling the, the uh, uh, nectar that goes to the flowers and nectar in nature flowers that have nectar have nectar and those that don't don't yes and you don't learn first on one and on the other it's, it's was, this experiment is utterly contrived yes it's utterly unnatural it's completely ignoring the workings of evolution <coughs> by evolution the bees have learned have have evolved mechanism to go by experience and that's that is the reasonable thing to do. Selton's umbrella, <laughs> okay. The late Professor Reinhard Selton took an umbrella everywhere, even to Israel's Negev Desert. Des uh, uh, to desert in midsummer when it never, never rains, okay? Rule, same thing as before, go by experience, okay? That's the rule that Reinhardt was following. Selton lived in Germany where it may always rain, even if the sky is completely blue when you go out. He internalized this experience and went by it, could not be bothered to adjust his habits to the particular place in which he found himself. Uh, this is admittedly an extreme instance in which the decision maker himself is aware that he is adhering to the rule rather than fitting his behavior to the particular situation at hand. But it's the same thing, it's go by experience, yeah? Uh, okay, let's go to the next one. Not buying subsidized flood insurance. This is another story that was told to me by Ken Arrow. Okay, so uh, uh, the 
this is, you, you could consider it uh, the second arrow lecture <laughs> this, uh, uh, this summer. Set up. <coughs> the Mississippi Valley is frequently flooded. Large tracts of land are inundated, crops destroyed, cattle drowned, houses, bonds, etc., destroyed. The federal government offers highly subsidized flood insurance. Really an excellent deal. It's highly subsidized, okay? It really an excellent deal. Behavior. Very few farmers buy the insurance. Okay? This is a private communication from Arrow. And he was really puzzled. He said, why don't the farmers buy the insurance, okay? <coughs> Rule, depend on Uncle Sam. <laughs> Analysis. Often when a flood occurs, the area is declared a federal disaster area. The few farmers who bought the insurance are compensated. So are the many who didn't. <laughs> okay. So the rule is depend on Uncle Sam. <laughs> okay. They, they, and the, the farmers learned this from experience. And, and not necessarily, they don't, they, they don't consciously, I think, say, okay, Uncle Sam will, will, uh, will pay in any case. But they, they learned it from their parents, okay? They say, you don't buy flood insurance, okay? And, and it, 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 it's in the culture, okay? One doesn't buy flood insurance, and it pays not to buy flood insurance. Questions? Yeah. What, there's an, there may be an irrationality on the part of Uncle Sam here. Okay, all right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, he is, he, uh, Uncle Sam is, is uh, uh, motivating, incentivizing farmers not to buy the flood insurance. You're right, uh, actually, actually, yeah. Mowing your lawn. Uh, Stanley mows his lawn every weekend and it gives him terrible hay fever. I ask Stan why he doesn't hire a kid to mow his lawn. Stan says he doesn't want to pay the $10. I ask Stan whether he would mow his neighbor's lawn for $20. And he says, no, of course not. <laughs> okay. Uh, Stan is violating the economic principle, the mainstream economic concept that buying and selling prices should be about the same. I don't think Taylor got that right, but, but I mean, this is obviously irrational, yes. Uh, the rule in this case is take care of your own. On its face, this looks like an irrationally sentimental attachment to an inanimate object like your lawn, yes? In fact, among other things, Stanley wants a job well done. He's not interested in inspecting the lawn and possibly arguing with the kid or his father and so on. What's called transaction costs in economics. Learned in the course of time from, uh, from similar scenarios, often not consciously, the rule, take care of your own, is a heuristic that evolved as a practical way to avoid these costs. He wants a job well done, so do it yourself, okay? Left digit bias, this is a, a nice one, okay? Questions, if questions are welcome at the end of each slide, let me, let me uh, um, uh, repeat that. Yes, sir.
left digit bias. This is not Taylor, okay? This is from the medical literature. The, the definition of le left digit bias is a tendency to categorize continuous variables on the basis of the leftmost numeric digit. Left digit bias explains why items are often priced at 499 as opposed to five euros, okay? The behavior, heart attack patients who are 80 years and two weeks old <laughs> may well get significantly more conservative treatment than those who are 79 years and 50 weeks old, okay? <laughs> and this is uh, a paper by Olensky and his uh, co-workers, behavioral something or other, I forget the whole title. It's in the New England Journal of Medicine, which uh, w is one of the two top medical journals in the world. It used to be the top, but I've heard that Lancet is now uh, considered uh, 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 more prestigious than the New England Journal of Medicine. <coughs> okay. Oh, this doesn't make any sense on the face of it, right? Doesn't make any sense. So what's the rule? The rule is kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Yes? <laughs> uh, keep it as simple as possible. That's the rule. Uh, analysis. Age is just one factor affecting the complex decision, which must be reached very quickly on whether to do a bypass. But it is an important factor which sums up more amorphous, less explicit, less well understood factors. Age, okay, age. <coughs> if physicians <coughs> use the computer program to decide whether to do a bypass or not, what could enter age as a gradually increasing parameter, okay? One could put in the precise age of the patient. But they do not, they don't use computer programs. They use their judgment based on age and other more directly related data, okay? Under these circumstances, a left digit cutoff seems not only sensible, but in fact optimal, okay? You, you, uh, how old is this guy? Is he over 80, under 80? <laughs> That's it, yeah? Uh, so uh, some people who are near 80 can, may fall into a, into a gray area, but the physicians, they, they have to reach a, a, a decision within 15 minutes or 20 minutes or something like that, yeah? And, uh, you can't, you can't, uh, uh, they, they can't figure in. They, they use it the, uh, as the rule over or under 80. And it's, uh, it's sensible. Framing, I have two slides on framing. So this is the first one. Two groups of respondents were asked which of two medical procedures, is a famous experiment of Kahn Kahneman and Tresco, well, not experiment, it's a famous survey, yes. There's a difference between experiments and surveys. Uh, which of two medical procedures, A and B, to recommend on the basis of expected results? Okay, now again, this is something where we're not talking about physician, or like in the beer on the beach, we're not talking about people who are actually lying on the beach. We're not talking about physicians who are actually faced with a, uh, with a decision to make in a particular case. But what would you do if, so for one group, there were, the results were framed in terms of the numbers of deaths. For the other, exactly the same results were framed, exactly the same, were framed in terms of numbers of survivors, okay? Uh, B, 
behavior. In one group, three quarters of the respondents recommended A, uh, okay? In the other, three quarters recommended B. Now, I, I don't know exactly whether these were positions. I think some of, the, some of these experiments or surveys have been done uh, um, with, with uh, non-physicians, okay? I think some may have been done with physicians also, but in any case, it's what would you do and, uh, and not what do you do. Rule is social desirability. Answer what you think is expected. Uh, answer what you're cued to answer. Okay. Um, the Christmas gift. Again, questions welcome. Yes, sir. Not behaving, answering, okay? Answering, sur yeah. survival. But I think that might be uh, related to some other topics uh, spoken from, uh, uh, by other lecturers uh, before. In, in, in particular, narrative, right? Like politicians selling you this policy where you save certain amount of people from this deadly disease, or if I do that, a uh, certain proportion of people will die from this deadly disease, right? It could, they could Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and not, I'm not talking about rationality or irrationality, but I think there's a, you know, a direction to go to to see uh, political narrative competition. Um, yeah, I think that's right. The, the, the framing is important. Yes, the uh, whether in 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 the way people respond. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Like the uh, but a physician faced with a a patient. Okay. It, the, the question is not framed in words, certain numbers die. You have a patient in front of you, okay? Right. So you, you, you do what you think is optimal in that case, taking both the death and the life into account. <coughs> the Christmas gift. Another quote from Taylor. Behavior. Lee's wife gives him an expensive cashmere sweater for Christmas. He had seen the sweater, Lee had seen the sweater in the store and decided that it was too big of an indulgence to feel good about buying it. With an expensive cashmere sweater. He is nevertheless delighted with the gift. The same sweater. Lee and his wife pool all their financial assets. Neither has any separate source of money. This is inconsistent, says Thaler, Thaler <coughs> with, uh, uh, with mainstream economics. Lee feels better about spending family resources on an expensive sweater if his wife made the decision though the sweater was no cheaper. Well, he says it's irrational, okay? It's irrational for him to be happy with, uh, with this uh, gift. The rule, appreciate your watch love, okay? The analysis, many of us value our personal relationships very highly. Okay, many of us, some of us don't, I guess, <laughs> but uh, many of us do, okay? Lee's wife gives him the sweater as a sign of love. Lee realizes this and appreciates it. It makes him feel good. That he really likes the sweater also for its own sake and was even considering buying it makes him feel all the better, okay? In our humble opinion, it's really strange to consider this a challenge to mainstream economics. In other words, irrational. Rationality is about promoting your goals, but not only your financial goals. Why do we give people gifts? We just give them the money. <laughs> 
Yeah. And they would have more flexibility than yeah, to spend yeah. it on something they really wanted. But that's not the point of gifts. And, and, and Taylor must know that. Yeah, I guess so. Okay, yeah, okay. He should, yes. <laughs> it's in his book. Miss me, tw page 20. It's, he has a list at the beginning of his book, a list of examples. This is one of them. I think all of them are included in my in this lecture. Okay? Besides, this is a Christmas gift. Surely Lee expects money to be spent for that. He's justifiably delighted that um, he was spent on something he really wanted. Even ignoring immaterial goals, like we did in the previous analysis, in the analysis over here, and what you're saying, yes? Even ignoring that, how is that inconsistent with mainstream economics? He knows that, uh, that, that money has to be spent for a Christmas gift. You know, when, uh, you're going to pass Christmas without exchanging gifts with your wife. <laughs> uh, oh, beer on the beach we did. Focusing, placing too much importance on one aspect of an event. Too much, okay. The scenario. Respondents in a survey were asked to rank the following outcomes from most to least likely. <coughs> Assuming that Bjorn Borg reaches the 81, 1981 Wimbledon final. The first uh, outcome is Borg will win the match. The second is Borg will lose the first set. The third is Borg will lose the first set but win the match. And the fourth is Borg will win the first set but lose the match. Okay, those are the four possibilities. And uh, respondents were asked to uh, uh, to uh, rank this in terms of uh, likelihood behavior. 72% of the respondents rated three more likely than two, <laughs> okay? Borg will lose the first set but win the match was rated more likely than Borg will lose the first set, okay? This is an another uh, Linda, okay? Uh, but the, but the, the, what's going on over here is not the Linda thing. It's not relevance. We're not talking about relevance over here. Uh, which is nonsensical. Here, respondents focused on Borg's outstanding reputation. If they're told only that he loses the first set, he sounds like a loser. Or they had to respond immediately. People were stopped on the street or, or on the campus, yes, and they say, yeah, rank these, okay? And these were the answers. 72% said this. If they're told only that he loses the first set, he sounds like a loser. If they're told that he loses the first set but wins the match, he sounds like a winner, <laughs> okay? Which seems more likely, or on the face of it, yes, uh, if you're re responding immediately. Rule, focus, okay? So here we are focusing on Borg's outstanding reputation, okay? We're focusing on that one aspect of the situation. And the rule is focus, okay? That's, and, and that is, it's called a bias in the, by behavioral economists. Uh, a bias, uh, uh, wrong, and it, 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 it does give the wrong results, but in general, We'll see. Analysis. Another contrived scenario. To be sure, placing too much importance on one aspect of an event is not a good idea. That's what too means, okay? But how much is too much? That depends on the circumstances. When the incentives justify devoting time and effort to analyzing the situation, then focusing on one aspect is likely to be suboptimal. But in the Borg example, that was not the case. 
it's safe to assume that the incentives did not justify spending much time to come up with a response. Okay? That means that it would be irrational to do so. Using a shortcut that focuses on the salient feature, in this case, Borg's ability, seems not only reasonable, but optimal, okay? That's my analysis. Questions? Sunk costs. This, this okay. is similar to, to Linda, if I'm asking it's, it's a, But in Linda, we, in Linda we have the, uh, the relevance axiom, okay? It's not, it's not folk, the, the relevance maxim is, is violated in Linda. But isn't the relevance axiom? No, yeah. over here, the, the relevance uh, maxim is not violated here. No, everything is relevant. We would do. Okay. 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 Some costs. Uh, Jeffrey and I somehow get two free tickets to a professional basketball game in Buffalo. Normally, an hour and a half drive from where we live in Rochester. The day of the game, there's a big snowstorm. We decide not to go, but Jeffrey remarks that had we bought the expensive ticket, had we bought them and not get, uh, uh, gotten them free tickets, had we bought the expensive tickets, we would have braved the blizzard and attempted to drive to the game. Okay? And that's because the, the expensive tickets you, they already bought, okay? They cost a lot of money, and it's a sunk cost, okay? So, um, this is inconsistent with economic theory. Jeffrey is ig ignoring the economist's the dictum to ignore sunk costs, meaning money that has already been spent. So, in spite of the fact that it's expensive, he spent the money already, and uh, and you are, uh, uh, you want to use that money, and so you're going to brave the blizzard, okay? But if you got it for free, <coughs> then uh, you don't care about losing the money, so you're not going to brave the blizzard. But this ignores really the economist's dictum to ignore some costs, okay? Uh, rule. Buying expensive tickets shows that you really want to go. When you get them for free, you also want to go, but probably not with the same intensity of desire. Some costs constitute a heuristic that enables you subconsciously to gauge your own feelings, okay? When you bought the tickets, you really wanted to go. You got them. Okay, it's nice to have gotten them, but it doesn't, it, it not necessarily, uh, um, it doesn't necessarily indicate your desire to get, to go to that ball game, okay? And, and <coughs> they are, people are thinking in terms of some costs, okay? But the, the, uh, the, uh, it, the sunk cost is a heuristic. You, the fact that you paid for it tells you that you really wanted to go, okay? That it's a, it's a, a gauge. Uh, Can I ask a question on that? Yes, sir. Um, why does it matter if you really wanted to go in the past? Like, can't your preferences change over time? So now you don't really want to go as much as before. And what matters is well, that now... Why, why do you not want to go? You want to go, you're interested in the ball game. where they actually bought a ticket 
but it still wouldn't go because of the yeah, it's possible. It's possible, and I think the in general, if some cost, uh, okay, the 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 the, uh, the usual way of some cost is you bought a ticket to a show or to a concert or something like that, and you lost it. Okay, did you buy another ticket? And the uh, and the if you if you are in in terms of some cost, you would say, no, I don't buy the ticket, okay? Uh, but I think I, 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 the, the rational thing to do is to buy another ticket if you wanted to go to the concert, because that cost of a ticket does not affect your financial standing uh, by, by any significant amount. So the thing to do is to buy another ticket, okay? But uh, some people, it's claimed, or maybe in a survey, people say they would not buy another ticket, all right? But I think most of us would buy another ticket, actually, okay? I don't know, I would buy another ticket, but, you know, I'm pretty comfortable financially. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're, you're, you're saying that... Uh, you know, that it was suggested here that actually... Yeah. Uh, you're, you're uh, I'm saying that maybe this is wrong. That this right. was the question I had. Yeah. But even if it's right, yeah, mm -hmm. even if it's right, uh, it's it's justified because because the because the having paid for it gauges the amount of desire that you want to go to that basketball game. It's, it's a, a sign of the intensity of your desire. Yeah. Okay, we're talking about intensities, okay? Intensities of desire. Okay? Uh, good. Generosity, the dictator game. An experimental subject, D, dictator, okay, is endowed with a non-trivial sum of <coughs> money, perhaps 20 euros, and is told that he may either take it all for himself or give part of it to some specific other person, R, recipient, uh, to whom he does not know. He doesn't know the recipient. Behavior. Many subjects give away a considerable part, sometimes as much as 30%. Okay. The rule, <coughs> be generous. <coughs> Okay, that's the rule, being generous. Analysis. In repeated interactions, cooperation is known to be rational. That's the folk theorem, okay? It may then take the over form of generosity. I help you today, ostensibly without any quid pro quo, and you help me tomorrow also ostensibly without any quid pro quo. This is rational because people expect others to be forthcoming, and if they are not, may well punish them. Okay, that's the uh, proof of the folk theorem. But even in one-time encounters, generosity may well be rational. Rather than keeping accounts of who helped whom when, it may be simpler just to be generous, as a rule. Many human interactions are at least potentially repeated or long-term. In such cases, acting generously as a rule will work vis-a-vis -vis others who also are generous as a rule, and it will also work vis-a-vis -vis others who do keep accounts, okay? So if you were generous to me yesterday, I'll be generous to you today. That's keeping accounts. But it also works to others who do not keep accounts. So the observed behavior does accord with the rule. But in my humble opinion, it's not rational. Why should the dictator grant anything at all to a totally anonymous recipient? If he wants to be generous, why doesn't he take the entire endowment and then grant a part to a needy relative or a worthy cause 
or whatever he deems appropriate. Why should he give it to this anonymous R? He doesn't know anything about R. This is a good example of our main thesis, that rules have evolved and so do not work in contrived artificial situations. Okay, they, it's the, the rule of be generous is in general uh, a good idea, okay? It's a good idea to be generous. But, um, I, I, I see you, okay? Uh, it's a good idea to be generous. But in the dictator game, it's not such a good idea, okay? Uh, it's, it's silly, yes? Uh, wh wh why don't you give it to say, you want to be generous? Be generous with, 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 with some purpose, yes? You, you might be, uh, you might be uh, uh, the recipient might be Rothschild, yes? Uh, uh, so this is a good example of our main thesis that rules have evolved and so do not work in contrived artificial situations of which the dictator game is a prime example. Yes, sir. Yeah, I cannot fully agree with this explanation. Okay. For me, it more looks like dictator understand that uh, if he doesn't give as much money to recipient, uh, the recipient just uh, declines the offer and he gets nothing. No, 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 no. This is not the ultimatum game. Ah, it's not the ultimatum game, okay? He can give whatever he wants. Uh, yes. yes, it's a dictator game. He can give whatever he wants. He can give nothing, okay? All right. No, but so the dictator game is certainly artificial, but there there are other situations which actually occur with reasonable frequency in which we see a similar inconsistency in many supermarkets, when you're checking out, they ask you, would you like to add a dollar to your bill or two dollars to your bill for some worthy cause? Yeah. Um, it's a worthy cause, not but, an but anonymous it's, recipient. It's not, huh? your, it's not your worthy cause. No, oh, okay, uh, but it's and a worthy and cause and, and uh, uh, I actually, I like to give to worthy causes also, but I, al I always turn that down at supermarkets. <laughs> yeah. I always turn that down because I have my worthy cause. Not, that's exactly. So, yeah. so most people have their worthy causes, and, and, and rather than getting a dollar to the uh, supermarket's worthy cause, yeah. it probably makes more sense for them to give that dollar to their own worthy cause, but they don't. Yeah. So, so, so that...
Okay. A hundred thirty seven is a hundred percent. Behavior I, that's Dick Taylor. <coughs> oh, Dick Taylor, Taylor, okay. Composed an exam to distinguish between three kinds of students. Those who really mastered the material, those who grasped the basic concept, and those who just didn't get it. As a result, there was a wide dispersion of scores, and the average was only 72 out of 100. Grading was on the curve, with the average set at B+. Plus. So the exam's difficulty did not affect the grade. But the students were in an uproar, and I was a young professor who wanted to keep his job. On the next exam, I set the perfect score at 137. The average score was about 99, and everyone was happy. Okay? Rule. 90 to 100 is excellent, 80 to 90 is good, 70 to 80 is fair, 60 to 70 is borderline. That's the rule, okay? The whole world, billions of people go by this rule. So it's been internalized and sets your mood. When your mom asks about your exam score and you say 72, that's one thing, okay? <laughs> 99 is something else. This is a good <laughs> example of our thesis. People don't think things through. They go by the rule. A perfect score of 137 is highly uncommon. So people are misled. Actually, here the two errors cancel each other out, and we are left with a reasonable result which is what the young professor intended, okay? Anchoring. Yes, sir, yes. Uh, sorry, I just want to add that this is indeed true. In, I'm from Edinburgh, and um, we, have a, we have a grading system where 70% is distinction. So if you actually get a 70 in the exam, it's very good, but new master students, uh, they have a hard time accepting that. They think that when you get 70, it's because we are not giving high enough marks and we're not doing you, you well. have You have a, a, a little hard of hearing. Yeah, sorry. Um, you have a what? So in, in, at least in Edinburgh, we have a rating system where 70% is distinction, is the best way you can, the best level of grade. The best, 70%, yes. Yes, so and students indeed have a hard time accepting that when they first arrive in Edinburgh. They would think that they did badly in the exam when they get to 71, yeah. but actually they already have the highest level. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, yeah, right. That's another example. Yeah, very good. Let me uh, skip to this because time is getting short, okay? Um, okay. Uh, risk of, uh, uh, no. Paying not to go to the gym. Behavior, health club customers may choose an annual contract and go as often as they wish for a monthly fee of $70. Or they may pay $10 per visit using a 10-visit pass, okay? So they pay $100 for the pass, uh, okay? And it, it gives you 10 visits. Or they can go as often as they like for $70. Or they could pay $12 for each visit, for a separate visit. Those choosing the annual contract attend an average of 4.3 times per month. So the price per expected visit is $17, okay? Much more 
than the uh, than uh, um, even the single visit pass, single visit cost, and still more than the pass for ten visits. More behavior. In year two, the annual contract users paid an average of eight o two dollars per visit. Okay? So they went more often, yes. Rule, learn about yourself, okay? In year one, the customers are not yet aware of their own preferences or of their own practices. How much they like the gym, how it fits in with other activity. <coughs> in year two, they've learned what they need to know about themselves. Moreover, in year one, customers may wish to give themselves incentives to go. With a contract, the visit they are now contemplating is free, okay? So they want to give themselves incentives to go. They want to go to the, to the health club, but, uh, but uh, they want a situation where Oh, where, they give, where, where going may be free, yes? Going to, to the health club may be free and, and, uh, and, and um, rather than going to a movie or to a show or to a ball game or something or to a restaurant or something else. Okay? That's paying not to go to the gym. And here's the second framing. Uh, the scenario is 73 general practitioners uh, answered a written questionnaire containing data from one clinical trial of treatment of hypertension in the elderly. The data was presented in the following four different ways, as if from four different trials. Drug A, patients on drug A had 3.65 uh, strokes per 100 patients over five years. The placebo, uh, placebo group had 5.4 strokes. Thus, drug A produced a 1.75% absolute <laughs> reduction in the number of strokes over a five-year period. <coughs> also, patients receiving drug A had 3.85 co coronaries per 100 patients over five years whereas the placebo group had 6.35 coronaries, okay? That's, that's drug A. And drug B, I won't, uh, is this. Uh, uh, drug B is, uh, patients on drug B had 32.4% fewer strokes, and uh, uh, compared with the placebo group, also, the treatment group at 39.4 fewer coronaries than the control group. Okay, and there's the drug C uh, also, and it's, it's stated in <coughs> other ways, and drug D is stated in a different way again. The B, uh, okay, so the, the 73 questionnaires were returned, all of them. Relative risk reduction, Drug B was the only presentation which was significantly different from the others, okay? They, they, the, the, the drug A and drug B look quite the same. Uh, a drug uh, uh, B the ha seems to have the biggest effect, okay? You go from 32.4 fewer strokes than in the placebo group. Okay, uh, that, that's, that's a big number, 32.4 percent, okay? What were, the, uh, what were the doctors asked about? The doctors were asked, which drug would you prefer? Yeah, okay. which drug would you prefer? That's what they were asked. Uh, and or which, and which drug would you prescribe, okay? And, and they chose B. And they what chose B, uh, um, okay? Uh, two 
out of the 73 realized that all the data were the same, okay? But only two out of the 73. 75 percent of the general practitioners admitted having problems understanding statistics that are commonly found in medical journals. Okay? So this is a, a paper by Cranny and Wally. Same information, different decisions. Okay? Now, this is framing. It's a question of how you frame the results, right? The rule is Choose the drug with the most prominent effect. That's the rule, okay? The most prominent. Again, there we have a trick question here. A highly contrived scenario which never occurs in the real world. In the real world, the statistics on the four drugs would be presented in the same way. And then the most prominent is also the most effective. As always, the rule is a good rule, but only when applied in naturally occurring scenarios. Trading on the stock exchange we did yesterday. So let me go to the conclusions. Uh, mainstream economics is valid after all. On the whole, people behave rationally though perhaps they don't think rationally. It's not true that people don't behave as economists think. Behavioral economics is also valid. Indeed, it's very important. People don't consciously optimize. They follow rules of thumb, heuristics, and biases. So it's important to know what the rules are. For example, it's important to make your conversation relevant. Okay, that's just one example. We've, we've gone through all these many examples. In short, far from contradicting each other, mainstream and behavioral economics complement each other beautifully. Behavioral economics is what makes mainstream economics work. Uh, we have uh, five minutes for questions. I always... Uh, um, in my lectures, I say thank you in the language of the country in which I'm lecturing. So, Tadaraba, thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, questions or discussion or remarks or whatever. Yes? Mainstream economics has broadened. That's what you're saying, right? I think, I think so. You think so? Well, I'm not sure. Maybe. Maybe, but uh, um, you were also around in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I think he's right. I, 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 I think uh, I think we are more tolerant. So that, that's, uh, okay, so that's uh, uh, another reason. See, I'm, I'm not against, I'm not knocking behavioral economics, okay? So I think that's a contribution of 
behaviorally correct. If that's correct, I'm not sure. I agree with you, Eric. But uh, uh, but uh, I think we were thinking in different terms, maybe. But I don't think more was considered right. But maybe, maybe. In that case, behavioral economics has uh, made another contribution, yes, to uh, to mainstream economics, and that is uh, softening our our. Uh, uh, expectations from mainstream economics. Okay, so that's good. I think B and ME go together. They work together. And, and the, my only quarrel with the behavioral e economists is not that not what they really are pushing, yes, but that they accentuate the negative. Okay, uh, they uh, like I said at the beginning of the talk. Um, Okay, uh, Tversky and Kahneman themselves said in 74, in general, these heuristics are quite useful, okay? But sometimes they lead to severe and systematic errors, and then they went on to emphasize the sometimes and not the in general. Okay, more uh, comments or questions or discussion, yes? something from experiments. I don't think you can learn very much from surveys. But uh, so uh, the BE literature has experiments and surveys. Maybe you can learn something from experiments. Not very much. I would prefer, uh, I would prefer uh, natural experiments, like uh, what Angrist and his, his uh, fellow uh, uh, economists are doing okay. Natural experiments in which the people really are motivated to uh, to do what 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 you what you're uh, what you're looking for. But experiments are better than surveys. Okay. <laughs> okay. But so uh, but yes, yes. But most. <laughs> so uh, you don't dislike them as much. Uh, wait a minute. Did most of the examples come from the survey? I'm not sure. I mean, uh, I'm not sure about that. Let's see. Let's let's, let's go over this. Uh, okay. <laughs> examples. Overeating. We didn't treat. The, oh, we did. Yes. That's not a survey. <laughs> okay. Hyperbolic discounting. Uh, uh, I, the, 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 I didn't actually quote a survey on that, but there are surveys, in, I think, in the background of that. Okay, so that is a survey. 100% versus 99% is probably also a survey. The ultimatum game is an experiment. The endowment effect uh, is an experiment. Yes, uh, you had the mugs and the and the and the uh, the mugs and the Swiss chocolate bar. Probability matching is an experiment. Uh, choosing a higher probability of getting killed in combat is a it's the real world. It's neither an experiment nor nor uh, um, anchoring. We didn't treat bees, artificial flowers, and nectar as an experiment. Selton's umbrella is the real world. New York City taxi drivers is the real world. Not buying subsidized flood insurance is the real world. Focusing is a survey, okay? Uh, generosity um, is an experiment. Uh, some cost is just uh, what Taylor was uh, um, writing, which is pretty reasonable, okay? but neither a survey nor an experiment. 
Uh, the Christmas gift also neither a survey nor an experiment. Risk aversion we didn't treat. Mowing your lawn is again uh, sailor's imagination, but pretty accurate. <laughs> uh, avoiding temptation. Uh, avoiding temptation. Uh, I mean, that's something real, but it was neither an experiment nor a survey. Discounts, again, neither an experiment nor a survey. Framing is a survey. Left digit bias is the real world. Beer on the beach is a survey. Budget premium gas is the real world. Linda is a survey. Uh, 137, 100% is, is the real world. Paying not to go to the gym is the real world. And the second framing is a survey. Uh, trading on the stock exchange is the real world. Okay, so again, I thank you very much for your participation, and uh, let's have some, uh, oops. Uh, Let's have some coffee.